Okay, today we're going to work on um, another angular momentum problem. This one people consider usually one of the harder ones. Um, it's a turbo machinery problem, and this is a centrifugal pump. So first, I'm going to actually read the prompt because it's sort of important to understanding exactly what's going on here. So we have a pump with a flow rate Q exiting the impeller at an angle theta relative to the blades as shown in the image below. Fluid enters axially at section 1. Assuming incompressible flow at shaft angular velocity omega, derive a formula for the power to drive the impeller. Okay, so what makes this problem somewhat difficult is really understanding uh, the geometry of what's happening. So when we're starting out, our Reynolds transport theorem for angular momentum is going to look similar uh, to how it has in the past and it's going to look exactly like this and this is what you've seen in the last few problems and the simplifying assumptions again were um, steady state that got rid of the control volume term we have incompressible flow that lets rho be constant and we have velocity profile is constant that means it doesn't depend on the geometry of the cross section which lets us pretty much pull everything out of the integral except for dA and we can just integrate over that. So that isn't the hard part. The hard part is this cross product and this dot product. Okay, so first of all we really need to get a good grip on what velocity we're dealing with here. Um, and the velocity we're dealing with here always has to be the velocity of the fluid in the direction that the flow is going. So let's blow this up a bit. Okay, so the velocity we're dealing with is going to be this V relative. So over in this expression, we're going to do R cross V relative and V relative dot um, the normal vector. The other thing we need to remember um, is that this entire system is going to be rotating. So it has an angular velocity omega. And in this problem, from looking at this cross section over here, you could tell that the omega is going to be going clockwise if you look at this part right over here. So in these hydro or turbo machinery problems, um, your omega can either go clockwise or anti-clockwise. Um, or counterclockwise, I guess is what they call it. So it will either be moving um, with the relative velocity or against the relative velocity that's coming out of the impeller blades. In this case, we're going clockwise, so um, when you're converting this angular velocity to a linear velocity, you know that it's going to be acting tangent to the surface of the rotation. So here, if this entire system is rotating clockwise, the tangential velocity or the linear velocity from the angular velocity is going to be along here. Now, if you're going counterclockwise, then this vector would simply be pointing this way. So at the end of the day, it's only going to flip basically a positive or negative sign over a final answer, um, but you need, to, you need to pay attention to that. And when you're doing a turbo machinery problem, you should always, always, always uh, write out the, the geometry in the way that we're going to be doing here. Okay, so the next thing is we should worry about that radius arm before. So we know where our velocity is pointing. It's going to be this blue vector here. And we technically already know um, where this n is going to be pointing because we're along the surface. It's going to be normal to the surface along here. Um, what about R2? Well, R2 is simply going to point from the center, which is where all the flow is coming from, to the surface over here. And now it's pretty easy to point out that this radius arm is perpendicular to um, the, the linear velocity that comes from the angular velocity. So from that rotation, it's going to be perpendicular to that. So we already know that if we're going to do R2 cross this relative velocity, Remember what that really means, the cross bias is you're taking um, basically the part that is perpendicular to R2. So that's going to be the component of this relative velocity that is along this axis here. And if you remember either your vector formulas, 
um, a cross b equals a b sine theta or if you just look at the geometry here um, you'll see that well okay it's not going to be sine theta but in the formula it's sine theta but here uh, you want the component that's going to be along this axis so you're actually going to get a, a cosine theta so that's going to look like this so again you have the relative velocity component along this axis in opposition uh, to the, the angular velocity pointing in this direction. And when we're doing the cross product of R2 cross V relative, we're really going to be looking at this versus this. So in the end, we could call that quantity our tangential velocity, and that's going to look like this. So our omega going in the positive direction and then opposing it is the component of our relative velocity along the same axis. And the axis that is perpendicular to the, the radius arm, just as we were explaining in our cross pro product earlier. Okay, so the other thing we need to look at is what's going on with this v dot n. Remember, the v that we're using here is our relative velocity, so that's the one pointing along here. And if we're going to be looking at the, the normal vector, um, this isn't going to simply be, well, v dot n giving you, um, since this is outward, it's not going to give you just positive the magnitude of the velocity here. Because this v relative is not actually um, pointing the same direction as our normal vector. Our normal vector, remember, always comes off directly from the surface. So it's going to be looking something like this. Okay, so where is that going to fall in our diagram over here? Well, it's going to look something like this. So remember our V, our, our normal vector is going to be pointing along here. So when we're talking about our V dot N, we really want to capture the component of this relative velocity that points along this normal vector in the same way that when we're looking at the cross product, we want the component of the, the relative velocity that points along this axis that is orthogonal to the, the center of symmetry. You could do this entire analysis with vectors, by the way, uh, the way we've been doing it in the last few examples. If you were clever enough, you'd rotate this diagram so that you'd have easier symmetry. Um, but yeah, you could basically do everything we've been doing with, with just vectors. Let me extend this a bit. Okay, the next thing we need to talk about, well, okay, first I'll show you um, the expression we get from the geometry we've just looked at. So it's going to look like this. So remember from the cross product we get this, where V tangential is really just these two guys, again, orthogonal to our radius arm. And over here, this dot product, remember it's pointing outward, so it's an outlet, so you know it's going to be positive, and you know that it had to be the component of the relative velocity pointing along the normal. So we're going to call that V sub N2. Okay, what happens next? Well, the next thing we could do is simply integrate over that area from our other assumptions. We could just pull everything out, and our expression is going to look like this. Okay, so the next question is, well, first of all, I should point out, why did I order the things like this? Remember, I always like to put things in the, the form rho v a v r when we're talking about angular momentum. For um, mass conservation, it's great to do rho v a. For linear momentum, rho v a v. And for angular momentum, rho v a v r. The reason is that, remember, we could group v and a together to make our, our q, our volumetric flow. And we could group rho and q together to make m dot, our mass flow. But why did I choose v sub n2 instead of v sub t? Well, remember, when you're talking about our volumetric flow, we're assessing how much is going out of the system through the outlet. And again, that v n2 is what's following along with our 
outlet vector or outlet facing unit vector which is N2. So this is assessing how much is going out. So when you're looking at your volumetric flow out of the system it's going to be VN2A not VT times A. Okay another thing that makes it a little difficult for a lot of people to truly understand what's going on is uh, what does this sort of thing look like in three dimensions? So a lot of people uh, tend to think that the streams are coming out through here, but no, they're not coming out through here, and it's kind of misleading from the, the picture they originally give you. Uh, these are just the blades. So the blades are going to look like this. So the idea is that you have your flow basically moving along with the, the blades, not through here, as might look like from the 2D cross section. Uh, the other idea is that what is your control surface going to be? Remember our control volume is going to be all of this, but what is your control surface going to be? Well, it has to be where everything is coming out, right? So everything in between each of these blades and everything between the surface of the blades and the top of the blades. So what I mean is we're going to have something that looks like this. where this red is the circle well it's basically the yeah the circle or the circumference given by the impeller and this little orange height is a uh, b2 it's from the problem over here they're calling the thickness of this b2 this is the blade thickness and basically your your control surface is going to be a shell uh, coming outward and we have to say it's approximately the circumference times that thickness of the blade because you're not actually getting any anything coming out here, 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 or here. Your, your true area is going to be less than that shell because of these dead zones. But the idea is that you try to make your blades um, as small as possible so that when you do these kinds of calculations using the circumference times the thickness um, that you're approximately on the right track. So let's go from here and open up our expression once again. And once we do these substitutions, it will look something like a mess. So this. So same as before, this area is what I just showed you over here the circumference times the thickness here because we're looking at that shell again and this here is that tangential velocity that we figured out over here and remember the reason why it looks so complicated is you have two different vectors in opposition you have the rotation of the entire impeller and you have the component of the relative velocity that's going to be pointing um, tangential to the system so that's what you're going to look like here but remember, uh, the reason we put it in this form is that we can group these two things together um, to make our Q. But one more thing. The problem was actually asking for, at the beginning, the power P required to drive the impeller. Right now, we're looking at a torque. Now, if you remember what power is from general physics, it's essentially the amount of work you do per unit time. Okay? So when we're talking about forces, usually the power comes from um, force times velocity because remember force is in newtons and if you multiply it by velocity you get another meter up top and you get a second down bottom so that gets you the right units for power which again is work um, per time but this torque term remember torque is usually in newton meters so the only thing you're missing here is you're missing a time dimension in the bottom and the way to get the power from the torque is to simply use the angular velocity. So this is what I'm talking about here. Work is force over dis well force times distance um, over time. So torque to have the same units. Remember this is already newton meters, and omega is in one over seconds. So we get the right units for our power. So our expression for the power becomes the same thing as before but multiplied by an omega so it's going to look like this so again same expression as here just with an omega tagged on to the end the last thing you could do is what I was talking about before um, 
you could write everything in terms of volumetric flow. And the way you do that is you got to go back up to the, the geometry up here. So currently, the thing that's really messing this up here is this relative velocity here. So you need to convert the relative velocity to something that we, we could eventually use. And the way we could do that is by taking this expression and doing this to it. And this simply comes from geometry. Um, where does that geometry come from? Well, if you stare at this long enough, you'll, you'll figure out that if you take that relative velocity sine component, you'll actually get the normal velocity. That's what we were talking about a little bit earlier. I'm going to try to put that over here. So again, if, if you're looking over here, if the cosine theta will give you the component along here, then the sine theta will give you the component along here, and that'll be the, the Vn2. Now if you sub that in over here, um, into to this expression over here, you're going to get the Vn2, and then you're going to get a sine in the bottom, so you get that cotangent. Um, and then lastly, since the normal velocity is the velocity that actually corresponds to the, the outflow of the system, you could again write V times A, and then it's going to be the normal velocity times that area. So we're down here, we're going to take that normal velocity times that area, we're going to transform it into a Q, and now we have this normal velocity times the cotangent theta, and we could simply do what we usually do with the Q, and we could do this. So if this is confusing you, don't get hung up on it too much. Um, as long as you got this, that's all that really matters. Everything here is just algebraic manipulations. They're not that important. So this is your general equation for turbo machinery centrifugal pumps. Again, the only thing that really changes is if this angular velocity is going counterclockwise, then R2W is going to be pointing in the same direction as this over here, and you're actually going to get addition instead of subtraction. All right, I hope most of that made sense. I'll see you next time. We'll try to do some energy equations.